Welcome to the Eric Metaxas Show. Our humble objective? To change the world. We aim to do it one person at a time, but we're happy to break that rule if you have friends. Broadcasting live from the Empire State Building in the heart of New York City, if New York City has a heart, but it does. And they're broadcasting from it right now. The Eric Metaxas Show. With your permanent guest host, Eric Metaxas. Hey, hey, hey. This is Eric Metaxas. Boy, oh boy. Am I excited? Uh, in the previous hour, if you were listening with uh, David Limbo, I warned you. I mean, I, I told you that I would have Ann Coulter in the studio, <laughs> and I wasn't kidding. She's going to be here any minute. She's preceded by her laugh, but she'll be here any minute. Yes. Chris Himes, my Hello. producer, we're sitting here, and I want to talk to Ann about the debate last night. Sure. And I think when she arrives in the studio, she may very well literally be carrying. A bucket of water for Donald Trump. Literally a bucket of water. We're going to see. I'm going to ask her when she shows up here. Yeah, Yeah, no, I think that she might literally be carrying a bucket of water for Donald Trump. I want to ask her about that. I've got all kinds of specifics. I've laid all kinds of traps. This is a hard-hitting journalistic (laughs) interview. (laughs) Yes, you You mentioned it yesterday. It's a hard-hitting journalistic interview. Trump traps. This is no spin zone. O'Reilly stole that from me, but it's okay (laughs) because I'm a fan. I like him. You can have it. But, um, no, we're going to talk about uh, the parade we're going to talk about the debate. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff. If only Ann Coulter would show up. And here she is, my friend Ann Coulter. <laughs> Ann, here. thank you for being here. Hello, Eric. It's so it's, good to be here. I, I want to tell you, I've, I've gotten a lot of criticism. People are writing me and saying, Ann Coulter has swayed you on Trump. Why don't you have Rubio on the show? Why don't you have da da And it's just so funny because whenever they say that, I want them to talk to you directly. I want them to hear. So, yeah. so this is the fun of having you on the show is that I get to ask you the questions that they're, they're peppering me with. Oh, good. Um, and if we use the word pepper pot... In this, <laughs> does anybody get that? I think we get. I know. I know she gets it. That's uh, it refers to previous administration. Um, first of all, we have to say this. We didn't say this in the previous hour. Today is Veterans Day. Yes, as we all know, and we know it's Veterans Day. Yes. And the the funny thing is, in New York City, even if you didn't want to ce- celebrate Veterans Day, uh, you'd be forced to because there's mm-hmm. a parade. That cuts the city in half. You can actually hear the snare drums right now in the you bagpipes. Can... <laughs> Literally, I'm not. I'm not making a joke. You can hear them. But whenever there's a parade in New York City, flee to the hills. Yes, it is just unbelievable. Well, I started to say t- say to you downstairs after being held up for one hour <laughs> to get three blocks, not realizing that this is when the parade was going on and right in front of your building. Um, this is one of the two parades I approve of in New York City. I think, well, I guess three. I think there should be only three parades and any mayor who ran on this platform would win by acclamation. The two <laughs> parades people actually like and go to, the Thanksgiving Day Parade and the Halloween Day Parade, but that's at night. It's down in Greenwich Village. It's not like it's holding up any traffic. Um, Thanksgiving Day Parade, obviously all the the floats. It's a huge hit. Right. We see Santa Claus right. and the Veterans Day Parade just because uh, to honor them because they're veterans. Every other parade actually drives <coughs> all New Yorkers crazy. I actually Every disagree with you on the Halloween group. Parade. The, well, da- we'll the Halloween Parade is pornographic. One. It's become like... Um, I think they literally it's summoned actually up less Satan. pornographic. Now, I, I have been going... Oh, my gosh. Pretty much every year because there are a lot of, like, set designers from Broadway. I mean, some of the floats and, <coughs> and costumes are so amazing. And You're probably it used the to only be, person that wasn't stabbed this year. Is, well, that's de Blasio. That's not the Halloween yeah. parade. But it used to be a little bit more... Um, <coughs> A little bit more what you're thinking of. It's way less than that now. It's more It's more fun costumes. Well, you know, it's ironic because talking about the Halloween parade is literally the last thing I want to talk to you about. You are a treasure <laughs> trove of other kinds oh, of information. Oh, but I haven't finished the, oh, my mayor's plan. Just to finish that, every yes. ethnic parade should be held in, like, Madison Square Garden. No street fairs. We live on a tiny little island. You can't be shutting off streets like this. So we got the <laughs> three parades. I say any mayor who runs on that, everybody else in Madison Square Garden or Yankee Stadium, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, whatever's closed. Well, the, this is win the, by the corruption of Amer- of uh, New York politics. No kidding. Every ethnic group has, you know, the mayor by the throat and says, we need to have our parade. Well, I they mean- can have it, but it's just can't, they can't shut down streets. <coughs> oh, and my other policy is presidents cannot visit New York City, which means they could come. I mean, look, you're only president for four or eight years. You can't stay away from, again, a tiny little island with way too many cars. Um, so they could still come, but they'd have to sneak in. They wouldn't be shutting down avenues, have the whole Secret Service. They'd have to sneak in undercover. I'm sorry, what? Uh, okay. I actually think – I know eventually we're going to get to 
to Donald Trump. But um, OK, that's enough. Not talking about Trump. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I no kidding. My dear wife, Suzanne, said about two years ago. She thought Trump would make an amazing mayor of New York. And that, I'm not saying that to, to denigrate him now that he's running for president. But before right. anybody's thinking about I kind of thought, yeah, like yeah. he would probably be able to pull that off because the city needs oh, yeah. somebody. I mean, I almost – can Giuliani run again? Oh, I hope so. When, he's I not think going he to. But don't you think – wouldn't it be amazing? Yes. yes. Like My just backup when, choice is his replacement Democrat, by the way. Um, but this preet – I forget what his last name is, but he's an Indian Democrat, took Giuliani's position as um, U.S. attorney in New York. And he's fantastic. He's on fire. He's prosecuting everybody. He's and but criminals. I mean, he's the one who's gone after Shelley Silver, um, Dinesh D'Souza. You know, there there are people listening to the show all across the country saying, what? OK, you're right. No, we mind. better talk about national right. topics. Let's I know I just Trump, well, it's very all interesting. I talk about. Well, I want to ask you. <laughs> this is what I want to ask you specifically about Trump, because last night it was hilarious. We're, I'm watching the debate. I raced home from this terrific I hope you movie. Were following my tweets. And I wasn't and my computer wasn't even open. I couldn't. It's a long story. I had to eat my chili. <laughs> it's a long story. But honestly, last night's debate, what I what I think happened, because this has been happening in the background, but it finally was focused. Here's my theory, and I just want to know what you think. Whenever Trump has talked about actually deporting 11 million people or whatever, I think it's classic Trump in that he sort of means it, but he's sort of saying it for effect. On some level, he is um, – he's painted himself now – into a corner so that like on last night's debate, Kasich and uh, whoever else, uh, they were – and Bush were saying, you know, you, you can't possibly do this. Here's why you can't do it. In other words, there's a million different ways to criticize how you can't do this. You're ripping families apart, whatever. And I think that at the end of the day, he ought not to have painted himself into that corner. In other words, the idea of actually doing that – at some point, I'm thinking – He's going to have to backtrack. If he were if he were elected president, he's going to have to find a way to finagle out of it. In other words, when he says, "I think actually, you're the, insane." This no, is other by than you far thinking me insane. His most okay. I'm going to summarize your position. Trump announces he's running for president by talking exclusively about illegal immigration and Mexican rapists, and they're sending their their rapists and their drug addicts. He spends the entire summer touring with the families of Americans who have been killed by illegal immigrants. He is viciously attacked. He never backs down. No other Republican will take the posi- that position. He soars to the top of the polls. He is talked about illegal immigration long before he ran for president, requested and received an advanced copy of my book about immigration, not just illegal immigration. And your position is, yeah, but he doesn't really mean it. No. Well, A, no, I think no, that's, that's not what insane. I said. That's not what I said. And I'm talking B, specifically. OK, at least he's saying it, whereas the rest of them tell us no way we're building a wall. No way we're going to even try to. No, 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 no. We're, we're diverting. The wall is absolutely solid, wonderful. Well, not and one other candidate will support it until last night, Ted Cruz. Did Ted Cruz support For it? For the first time. The rest of them, oh, no, we're going to use high-tech devices. We're going to have tr- drones so we can watch them run across the border. We won't actually stop them, but we can watch them. May as well be entertained as long as we have no border. <clears throat> Chris, would you take that cup of coffee away from my guest, <laughs> uh, please? I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, she won't let go. Well, no. Sp- <laughs> I want to. I want to. <laughs> I want to be really... <laughs> focused here. I'm not disagreeing with anything except what I'm... In other words, if you're saying it's effective for him to saying this, that's my point. In other words, it's, it's utterly effective and people go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet no other Republican but No, 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 but that's wow, not, hey, that's I not the point. hey, I should say this. We're going to a break, but it just occurred to me. Did you call me insane? I think I Ann Coulter... No, you didn't. Ann insane. Coulter just that said, is you, <laughs> apostrophe R-E, insane... <laughs> And that's the, that's the kind of a timbre that I like to set for this program, that it's just we're going to be at each other's throats. Basically, it's the radio version of the old Morton Downey show. Somebody's going to bust show. a chair over Geraldo's head. We're going to go crazy. Folks, uh, my guest is Ann Coulter. We'll be right back at the Eric Metaxas show. Hey, folks, it's the Eric Metaxas show. I have Ann Coulter in the studio, literally. Literally. 
Uh, she's sitting here ac- across from me, and she's put on a ton of weight. What happened? What did you let yourself? What, what did you do? You, Chris, back yeah. me up on this. I, you know, I wish this weren't radio because people could see. She's the size of a house. She walks in here. I didn't recognize her. And what happened? No, we're just kidding. Okay, you're the only person, the only woman on planet Earth with whom I could joke about your weight. And I think that's a, that's a compliment. I want to ask you um, specifically, Anne, what I'm trying to say, because I don't want you to – this is not about Trump or about immigration. It's about a very specific point. Because he's such a great salesman, I'm sort of – in fact, I was defending him on this subject, that when he says that, he got a lot of press, he got a lot of attention, and most Americans – are saying we don't care about the details. The basic idea is correct. If this is if somebody is here illegally, they cannot be here. We're a nation of laws. They agree with all that. But what I'm saying is that when people are now very specifically attacking him on the logistics of deporting deporting 12 uh, million people, or it's actually funny. Yesterday, somebody said five million. Then the next one was 11 million, and then the next person, I think it was Jeb Bush, said 12 million. Like all these different numbers, but it's 30 to 50 million, 30... as you will see in my book. Really? Yeah. Well, then why wouldn't he say that? Trump absolutely never concedes that it is 11 million. Bless his heart. He has read my book, as all of your listeners sh- should, and you can come get it signed in Phoenix tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. Um, have, you got, have you got a book out? I'm What's going on? I'm doing an event with Hugh Hewitt. It just occurred to me that we didn't mention it in the first oh. seg- segment. He, we love Hugh Hewitt. We, uh, man, he's fantastic. What kind of an event is this? Um It's, uh, I forget what it's called. It's like a Patriot tour. There's the Patriot, one of your sister stations in Phoenix and it's um, in Scottsdale, which is Phoenix, basically. And it's 730 tomorrow night, Thursday. Uh, There may be a VIP event that starts before then. I know I get in very early. Um, And And, he'll interview me and then I'll I'll sign books. And what happens at these these VIP events? People can come up to you and... We and, chit chat and bend your ear, I'm, and I'm not even 100 percent sure we have one. But usually, it actually it usually goes pretty quickly. You get your book signed and get a picture. Why am I asking you this? I do VIP events. I know yeah, exactly you know. what happens, but yeah. I want to know what happens at your VIP <laughs> events because I want to. And it's that. fun because Hewitt and I disagree as you and I do on on Trump. So there's a lot of fire. Well, you and I don't really disagree on Trump as much as you think. I just want to get into some. Uh, see, to me, I'm not saying. For whom I am. See, that's proper English, and it sounds ridiculous. Yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah, saying yeah. who I'm for, but <laughs> for whom I am. But I, I always want to know. I want to get these specifics. Well, and okay, people get let very me emotional. Say a few things about Trump. One yeah, is why don't you get a word in your, edgewise? Go ahead. Exactly. Um, <laughs> unlike your wife, I never expected to like Donald Trump. I didn't dislike him, but I understand at least. At first blush, people thinking, oh, come on, he's a reality TV star. So let me just say I'm totally sympathetic to that. I would never have predicted in a million years I would be go Trump go right. um, and dedicating the next 18 months of my life to making sure he becomes the next president. Right. Um, but for one thing, he does – he has a long history of caring about Americans first. Um, I think I may have mentioned it on the last show. I should put it on my webpage. I've tweeted it out. But there was um, – I've looked up a lot of articles about him back from like the 80s and the 90s. He's always been a Republican. That is nonsense that he was a Democrat his whole life. Actually, you know who was a Democrat his whole life is Ben Carson. First time I found that out was yesterday. They keep saying it about Trump. No, he was at the 1988 Republican National Convention being interviewed by Larry King. Um, I saw the interview, and one of the charming things about him was King kept asking him about other stuff. And if you were alive then, you remember Dan Quayle, our conservative Christian Dan Quayle, was under vicious attack from not only liberals but from the establishment snooty types. Um, and and Trump kept coming back to with King. Yeah, I just saw Dan Quayle smart speak. He is very impressive. Wow. He is a very impressive. And then King would ask about something else, and he'd come back to talk about how impressive Dan Quayle was. And then one thing that most impressed me of all was in 1986, he got wind of a family farm in Georgia that had been in the, the family for five generations, was going under... It's an incredibly sad story. The husband committed suicide for the insurance money to save the family farm. Trump hears about this. He goes on a campaign. He calls up the bank, threatens them on the phone, says, you are go- you're going to be t- – we will sue you for $5 million or whatever he always says if you go through with this foreclosure. Gets the bank to put it off, starts going on, I miss raising money. He and uh, some Texas – 
um, oil magnate, I think it was, put up the money to save the family farm. They end up being able to make the money, save the farm. The whole family, this sweet Georgia family, flies up to Trump Towers. And this is in 1986. Burn the mortgage in Trump Towers and have Christmas dinner with the entire Trump family. And Trump's quote to the newspapers at the time, where we spend millions of dollars on farmers around the world. Why don't we care about American farmers? Now, that is a strain of his that has gone through his work forever. I know um, I know the, the lawyers for, for um, construction unions that have worked with him, and yeah. one of them was telling me uh, how they had— they had struck a deal with him at fair and square. He was going to contribute a certain amount, I think, to their health care. But they invested it in something stupid. They lost all their health care or all their retirement money. I forget what it was. They go back to various builders and say, look, this, this isn't your fault. You don't have to put anything in. But we blew all of our retirement money. Put it in a bad investment. Trump said, how much do you need? They love him, blue collar workers. He's always cared about Americans first. That strain runs through his view of the world the same way anti communism ran through Reagan's view of the world. As for immigration, back in 2013, after Romney lost um, and the entire Republican Party went mad and decided they must obsess with getting some tiny percentage more of 8.4% of the electorate, the Hispanic vote, and for the you know 29th consecutive year, blow off the 84.7%. Percent or no, it's seventy four point eight percent of the vote, the white vote. Um, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, or the Chamber of Commerce Political Action Committee, as it has become, had lots of immigration panels and speakers, and every single one of them was totally for amnesty. Rubio, Caesar Conda, Whit Ayers, you know the whole crew. And you know, immigration restrictionists were looking at this and saying, "You don't have a single anti-immigration speaker." When the C- CPAC was over, it was remarked upon. There were two people who spoke again at CPAC against illegal immigration. Ann Coulter and Donald Trump. And that's because we gave standalone speeches. Okay, that's back in March 2013. A week before my book came out, I did this interview with Jorge Ramos, um, doing a job Americans just won't do, interview Ann Coulter on her best-selling book. Um, It went around the internet. As I'm flying back to New York from Miami, I'm on my way to the airport. I've finished the debate the night before. I get an email from Trump's people requesting an advanced copy of the book. It was overnighted to him. And that's when you first started hearing about all of the gang rape, child rape, incest rape, the drugs pouring in across the border. See, the thing is, I just want to say to folks, uh, your books, one thing I can say, even if somebody, and I say this about my own books, it's like, even if you disagree with it, the facts are the facts. Right. The research has been done. You have to deal with it. And what you write about in your book, it's not racist. It's not incendiary. You're putting out facts which are interpreted that way. But the question is, how do people deal with the facts? And obviously, they don't deal with the facts. My question, when you talk about CPAC, you talk about the Republican establishment, do you really think that they're afraid? They're so, they're so afraid of losing, Donors. let's call it the Hispanic vote, that, they, that they're no. just not going to take Trump seriously? No. In fact, I think Trump is right that he will get more of the Hispanic vote than any other Republican because Hispanics who are here legally want their wages to go up. They want the jobs. He will get the maximum number of Hispanics who will ever vote for a Republican, um, which isn't a majority. But the, so but the establishment, in other words, you were saying that CPAC and to the company, donors. right, they're afraid of Trump because they think that he would not get elected because of his issue on immigration. Right. So that is why I no. No, 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 no. They do not care. They absolutely do not care. The, quote, establishment are not smart people. Look at the colleges they went to. I mean, I hate calling them elites. They are so not elite. They are utter mediocrity. Well, I'm not sure who, who are we talking about. But they have their about? little jobs working at the RNC or for this lobbyist group or that lobbyist group. And they want to be the Washington generals to the Democrats Harlem Globetrotters. They want to be good <laughs> losers. They want to be wow. respected. They want to be quoted in the Washington you. Post and right, the New York right. Times. And they keep forcing Republicans to take suicidal positions. And I will add to that, obviously, it is because of immigration, which is decides every other issue, which is why it's the most important issue facing the country. Um, and is very very important for everything, the economy, the crime rate, drugs, drug addiction, everything. That is why I love Trump. But I will say that on these other issues, 
what's the other biggest position he's taken? Overturning hedge fund operators paying a 12 percent tax rate. Right. Why is he the first presidential candidate to make that the centerpiece of his tax plan? The Democrats won't do it. The Republicans won't Tell do me it. Tell me why. I know why. Because the donor the class, the donor class is the hedge I, fund guys. Trump is totally exposing these people for wow. being absolutely beholden to the establishment, to the donor class. And screwing Americans. And he is, whatever you don't like about him, whenever you think, oh, I wish an, a, another Republican would come along and talk like him. No, they can't. They need the money. We needed an eccentric billionaire. We have to go to a break. Uh, I hate to uh, to stop here, but we'll be right back. I'm talking to Ann Coulter about the election. But uh, I think it's more important we listen to David Cassidy for a few seconds. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hey, it's the Eric from Texas Show talking to... Ann Coulter, not the Ann Coulter. She's far too busy to come on the show, but an incredible look-alike, sound-alike. It might as well be the real thing. So, Ann, and I'm doing air quotes when I say, Ann, how are you? Um, I want to ask you, I want to see if I can get your opinion on a, a, a recent contretemps. I just want to use the word contretemps. That's, That's in nice. italics. That's in italics. It's a French word. Uh, the the dust-up between Bill O'Reilly and George Will. I saw it as a kind of historic, weird moment between the old sort of elite guard of conservatism, meaning George Will and O'Reilly. But I was I was upset that it, it had come to that. Are you familiar with this? You may not even care, but it just struck well, me I as like a... Well, I saw the clip online. It, 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 was, it was almost frightening. When you've got this six-foot-six uh, angry Irishman thundering, uh, you know, he's, he's pre-violent at that point. I just don't know why O'Reilly is taking it so personally. He I doesn't do. write those books. I do. It's kind of like N- Nixon uh, at Hyannisport. It's just he looks at somebody like George Will no, as this elitist, he likes sneering. To pretend he writes books. I don't understand how people can get cocky and have intellectual pride and be snobs when they're hiring someone else to ghostwrite books for them. I, I mean, it's baffling. I mean, you're you're a real writer. I'm a real writer. <laughs> I don't understand the point of ghostwritten books at all. I'm against them. Um, I think you find out a lot of stuff, as I did, as I do in all my books. You do your own research. You discover new stuff. If you're just sending, and he's not even doing what most writers do, which is look up this fact for me. Well, if you know the fact you're already looking up, so does everyone else out there. It's Are just you... a pastiche of, you know, op-eds from the New York Post. His is a pastiche of, of Wikipedia pages, and as we all know, Wikipedia, not very accurate. Are um, you saying this just because you never, ever, ever want to be on his show again? Um, well, apparently, since I remember the Civil War and he doesn't, I won't. <laughs> Uh-oh. I have to, I confess, I'm a fan of, of Bill O'Reilly uh, for, for many, many reasons. But when he called George Will a hack, I was upset. It was unseemly. I don't go for that oh, sort of— you're one of the few people. Who cares? Still. Yeah. Well, I don't care. But you know what? Honestly, when, when uh, I don't like it when, when, when the gloves come off needlessly, when uh, it's, it's all— it's wonderful when somebody like Dick Cheney tells, you know, Patrick Leahy, you know, to blank off or something like that. Right. People, people feel like, oh, yeah, he gave it to him. But I just feel like it's unse- it's ungentlemanly. He should not oh, that do that. That was my favorite of his I know, quotes. but I would, I would disagree with you on that. I do think that Dick Cheney never should have said that. And when people say those things, it vulgarizes the whole culture. But speaking of which, let's talk about last night's debate. What was what was it in the debate that struck you? Anything? Do you, can you? Oh yeah. Do you? Um, I have to say, I have a great fondness for Carly Fiorina. I really do. You lied I think about she's the green room. Very thing. impressive. See, if you followed me on Twitter, you'd be so far ahead of this stuff. Carly got an I, applause line. Oh, I hate applause lines. At least you know the Trump was the the audience. You noticed from the beginning of well, you may not have you may have missed the beginning, but I always check to see which one has the which candidate has the largest paid cheering squad for right. when they're first introduced. And the only ones who did not have paid cheering squads were Kasich, probably because he doesn't have any fans, and Trump because he doesn't care. He'll, Say what he's going to say anyway. Um, so Carly got a big applause after um, Trump had commented that he spent a lot of time with Putin yeah, in the yeah. 60 Minutes green room. And Carly came back with, I, too, have met but look, Putin. That's and debates. It that's what they do in debates. Let Ann finish talking, Eric. Is Ann talking? And it wasn't in a TV green room. It was in before a meeting. Right. Um, so within 60 seconds, Anne had tweeted out the video of Carly Fiorina on Jimmy Fallon a few weeks ago saying she met Putin in a green room. 
Okay. So well, that's your big applause line? No, I think the Carly you're... Fiorina boom see, seems to have passed us. Okay. Um, no, I thought what was so the most striking like... was that this is now the fourth straight debate that Marco Rubio was not asked about his single legislative accomplishment, spending three years joining with Chuck Schumer to push amnesty through the Senate, which almost became law and wrecked the country. But thank God. And I mean that literally. Um, I'm not using the Lord's name in vain. The American people rose up and stopped it from being brought up by Boehner in the House. For three years, that's all Marco Rubio did. He is now, most recently, coming off that big success, that job-killing initiative. Um, He's come out for that um, TTP trade deal. Uh, yeah, Trump's, Trump, Trump's the only one, I think, of the whole Cruz voted gang, against it. And Cruz did as well. He voted against it, but it's hated by the base. It is hated by Americans. It allows American corporations to bring in as many foreign workers as they want without any bill being passed by Congress. Rubio voted for it. You know, the whole base is enraged at Mitch McConnell for allowing a vote on it. Well, he's not running for president. Marco Rubio. Now, we have had now had four Republican debates. Has Marco Rubio been asked about either immigration or the trade deal? Why? No, I'm glad you asked. He has not. No, he's asked, could you give us a segment of your pre-programmed speech that we've all heard eight million times before Rubio? Tell us about this is an election of the future. And Hillary's a candidate of the past because I've only right. heard that eight million times right. before. And even that he can't get it, get out without sweating all over the stage. Where do, where do you see this all going? I mean, I have to say that when I watch these debates, what it does for me, basically, is it makes me feel very proud of my country because I say that almost without exception, every one of these people would make a good president, some great presidents. And it, I get I just think we've got a deep bench. I'm I, proud I, of my country. I hate these candidates. I think they are awful. They are embarrassing. They are led by the RNC. They do not care about Americans to keep have them keep going through. Do I need to hear that every Republican is against tax hikes? No, I think I got that one. Do I need to hear them all denounced Islamic jihadists? No, I think we needed a debate exclusively on immigration, trade, and crime. A, that's the one issue Republicans disagree on. B, it's the only one that affects Americans' lives. Hang on, folks. We have Ann Coulter in the studio. Literally, it's the Eric Metaxas Show. Be right back. Hey, it's the Eric Metaxas Show. Sitting here with Ann Coulter, literally. Uh, And we are talking (laughs) about last night's debate. And I guess... You know, it sounds to me like you are for Trump. (laughs) Somebody tweeted to me yesterday or earlier this week. It was something like, so wait, are you saying we should support Trump? And I tweeted back, have I been subtle? Yeah, yeah. No, (laughs) never, ever. Um, Look, the only other one I like, and it's not surprising because he is very smart, is Ted Cruz is smart enough to adopt Trump's runaway popular issue. But as I think I've said to you before, he's not a natural-born citizen. I mean, if something were to happen to Trump and we can't get Romney back in, then I guess I'm just going to have to say, okay, nobody else cares about the Constitution, neither do I, but... I, I, what is it with conservatives? If we all bought, are we all Ruth Bader Ginsburg now? We don't care. He was born in Canada. He only had one American parent. He's not a natural born citizen. And by the way, Trump is going to need him in the Senate. Um, but he is very smart, and God bless him. You know, for the first time, he takes Trump's issues. Last night, he was for the first time fantastic on immigration, and for the first time, he comes out number two in the polls. Is that true? They're, From the debate polls. There are actual polls. See, I, I find these polls, I fin- in a way, the whole way this thing is run, it's entertaining. I think it's edifying. Last night was not entertaining. No. Well, I know. I, <laughs> it was I, I was snooze. I, actually, no, I thought, I thought I, here's, here's what I said to my w- wife and daughter who were stuck listening to me because I pay the rent sometimes. <laughs> they, 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 uh, here's what I said. I said, because Trump is in these debates... Tons of Americans who would not be watching them are watching them because there are so many candidates in the debates. Something is happening where America is getting this education. People are sitting and watching That's a good point. and they're getting the conservative point of view, which typically That's they don't hear. And I think this is an – in other words, you know, common wisdom would say, oh, this is bad for the Republicans. They're attacking each other and it's going to no, make they Hillary stronger. Been attacking one but even if they were, debates. even if they were, what's going on is strengthening the conservative position. It's it's edifying America. I think you're right now because I, the position I was taking before we went to the break was I don't need to hear them all keep going through how right. they're against tax hikes, against – but I see your point, people who who – 
aren't aware of the Republican position on taxes or Islamic jihadists. They're learning something. Um, but I, I mean, one thing, one other thing I will say in defense of 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 Trump, um, and I sent out a million tweets on it last night when Britt Hume accused him of um, blustery generalities. And it was so great to get specifics from Carly. Well, again, if you remember, we were kids then. That was the attack on Reagan. And you don't have to be saying this is that Trump is like Reagan. In a lot of ways, he is. He's talking about the most important issues and the other ones aren't. They're still living in 1980. Um no, it was, uh, that is how you want a presidential candidate to communicate. I mean, when when Carly and the rest, when they get into like the value added tax, my, I can't pay attention, and I care about politics. Right. Who is listening? No, give us the basic program. We don't need to have you prove. You know, you know the difference in the Kurds and the Kuds. Well, I mean, as you, Reagan you, you famously say that. said, yeah. I don't need to know their names. They're going to know my name. Right. Well, and that's I good, agree with that. That's a good debate point. I mean, look, I think that th- there's no – you can't look at it objectively because part of what they're trying to do is uh, win a debate, score points, get press. I mean it's, it's very complicated. But most people don't know a tenth of what you know. And I really – as I was sitting there thinking like your average American doesn't really think about why is the – in other words, people may be listening to this program. There are lots of people who care about this, but there are tons of voters who don't have the background to actually think, so why is the free market good and what, what is liberty and what works against liberty and why does – and I thought you're getting kind of like a, a course in I all of so. that I guess so. I would have picked better spokesmen for that course. Well, look, you get who you get. I mean, we yes, it's it's not – but I'm, so, I'm fascinated that you have nothing nice to say about Carly Fiorina. I think she's very impressive. She doesn't have she's to be sourpuss. better. Exactly. She's – She is. She never smiles. That's not true at all. You know, you and your liberal buddies at The View, you know, isn't that what Sean always says? You and your liberal buddies used to say to his colleague, I I think that she does smile and I think that she's tremendously impressive. I'm I'm with Trump here. She's pulling at like 1%. She's going to be on the lower debate (laughs) stage again soon. We can move on from Carly. I'm just fascinated. I'm fascinated. So you Jeb was, as usual, absolutely abominable, though I was not playing. I send out no negative tweets about him he, because I, I feel- want to keep him in the race so he will keep spending that hundred million dollars to attack Ricky Ricardo. Wow. You know, the, the thing is that, all. no, I Jeb Bush, uh, clearly, he doesn't have the he doesn't look like he's having fun. Oh, no, no, no. And, and that's in fact, a problem. Um, if I have time to make this point, you do. Um, I've noticed this dynamic in certain families where um, often the mother will favor the loser child. (laughs) Um, And it's just like, you know, the one who's always going to be there and take care of you and is such a good, you know, optimistic and cheerful. And, well, I I can just take that child for granted here. I'm going to elevate the loser. It's totally the prodigal son, except they're not really that prodigal. Anyway, I've noticed this dynamic in families before. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing with the Bush family, because that's this all comes from Barbara Bush. They wanted Jeb to be president. He was supposed to be the smart one. Wait a second. When Bush... But she said she didn't want him to when run. Bush, when W got into Yale, yeah. he was barely a legacy. Yeah, his father had gone there, but his father... I, I don't think he was even a congressman yet. Um, by the time Jeb applied to Yale, he was not only a double legacy, your father and your brother, but his father had been a congressman. He had at least run for the Senate, I believe. He was a U.N representative and still he ends up at a state school no he was never the impressive bush and also i mean i don't like bush for for pushing amnesty on us and and losing the senate by pushing amnesty as i describe in my book um but i will say i saw him on cnn being interviewed by um john meekham or maybe it was the other way around about john meekham's book on the senior bush right and i gotta tell you that george w bush really has a winning personality you know you're right you're ab- I, 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 no, no, no. You're exactly right. And I'm not saying this to be mean, and I know you are, but I do have to say <laughs> that Jeb Bush, he simply doesn't have – he's not having the fun. And there's a wink to W that it was winning. It was a yes. winning wink. We have to listen uh, to a little bit of um, my friend Wayne Newton. So hang on. We'll be right back. It's the Eric Metaxas Show. With Ferris wheels and sunshine laughter. And rainbow luck that lasted after the rain. That those are the words 
of William Wordsworth, stolen by Keith Partridge. I'm talking to Ann Coulter. I just won my first argument ever with Ann Coulter. <laughs> I just, I can't, I won, I won. I want to yeah. jump up and down, get the confetti. It's, uh, I, we it's just were playing, we were playing, we were playing Wayne Newton yeah. uh, earlier. And Anne would not believe me that that was actually Wayne Newton. It's very hard. It's almost impossible to believe. But it is the 18-year-old chubby Wayne Newton who was criticized by somebody. Was it Johnny Carson who made fun of him because he seemed effeminate and chubby yeah, and, the and voice whatever? Of a cherub. And he basically said, like, I'm going to I'll flatten you or something. Yeah. Like he ba- it was this kind of weird moment in yeah. the early 60s. It's a beautiful 60s. voice. And oh, it's gorgeous. I, well, I love Wayne Newton because he's for Trump. Yeah, yeah, no, but and no kidding. That that was his big hit, age eighteen. Anyway, we've covered that. I won and lost, and now we get to talk about other stuff. Okay, but Anne, you said you're doing this thing with Hugh Hewitt in 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 Phoenix tomorrow. Tomorrow night, seven thirty p.m. Phoenix. It's li- linked on my web page. And where in Phoenix? Do we know where? It's a, a Scottsdale. Some. Oh you, yeah, you that's right outside it. Phoenix. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. it's, it is. It's like basically a suburb. It's fifteen of Phoenix. minutes from the airport. And it's Hugh, very close. are you having a conversation with Hugh? Yes, he'll interview me. Um, and we disagree, so it's fun. And what do you disagree on? Um, he's kind of an open borders guy. Really? Well, not aggressively, but he's not a Trump guy. He's not. <laughs> and why? I'm just curious. What does he say? He knows so much about politics. I mean, he kind of, you know, that's his sport. He loves uh, politics. Um, he's not aggressively. Uh, open borders is the wrong word, but I think he takes more of the position that we need to dedicate more of our resources to winning the Hispanic vote. And right. no, I think we should dedicate more of our resources to getting white people who haven't voted for the last 29 years to come and vote for us. And they and I think they and would. they will it, with I, Trump. I agree with Hugh on almost everything, but I had a disagreement with him about Solzhenitsyn. Oh, really? The 1978 Harvard speech that Solzhenitsyn gave, uh-huh. Hugh was there. I think oh, he really? was graduating from Harvard that year. And I got, at a Socrates in the City event, I, I totally disagreed with him. I said that Solzhenitsyn was utterly prophetic and everything he said is basically true. And he took this kind of, I would say, sloppy, pseudo-Reagan-esque, <laughs> sunny view, optimistic view. Our future is ahead and America is going to be great. It's like, yes, but you have to see where things are bad first. But anyway, who knew? Oh, I'd and be by the about- way, to do a call back to an earlier issue, I do think um, – O'Reilly's ghostwriter is totally wrong that Reagan had any element of senility for Pete's sake. He won the Gold War. I mean, I described it in my book, Treason. Liberals went through that whole argument. Oh, he has dementia. No, he was opposing. What was interesting was at the end of the Reagan years when he allegedly, you know, had mentally failing health, which I describe in treason, his own side was against him when he was buttering up Gorbachev. It was Bill Buckley. It was Howard Phillips. It was my news. I thought he had gone mad because I was reading, you know, Wall Street Journal and National Review. He's buttering up Gorbachev. It turns out he was right and we were wrong. So don't tell me this is just an old guy going along with whatever's happening. Wow. And that's I, the thesis. That's I'm the speechless. disagreement between George Will and I'm Bill O'Reilly. Well, that, yes, but the point is O'Reilly is saying you can say what you want and you can you can be right basically, but I have these facts that this, he doesn't this meeting have a fact. happened. He has a disgruntled ex-aides comments about Reagan. And breaking Ann Coulter sides with George Will against Bill O'Reilly. I wish we could keep talking. And thank you so much for being here. Phoenix tomorrow, Ann Coulter and Hugh Hewitt. It's the Eric Taxa Show. Keep listening. Thank you.